inflammatory bowel disease. What is IBD? Inflammatory bowel diseases, or IBD, are chronic inflammatory conditions that primarily affect the gastrointestinal tract. The two main types of IBD are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. When the clinician cannot distinguish between the two, we refer to this as IBD undefined. IBD is a chronic disease, which means it is a diagnosis patients generally carry for their entire lives. It has a relapsing remitting course, which means patients can sometimes experience sustained symptom-free periods or remission, sometimes interspersed with disease flares where symptoms are increased. The learning objectives of this video are to 1. Recognize the clinical presentation of inflammatory bowel disease and compare Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis phenotypes. 2. Plan the diagnostic evaluation of patients with suspected IBD. And 3. Define treatment goals and list available treatment options. Epidemiology. Inflammatory bowel diseases are on the rise around the world and affect all age groups. IBD can be diagnosed at any age, but presents most commonly in teenagers and young adults. About 25% of all IBD starts in the pediatric age group, which will be the focus of this talk. IBD phenotypes. Patients with IBD can present with a wide range of symptoms, including abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloody stools, urgency to stool, or overnight stooling, fecal incontinence, fatigue, fevers, mouth ulcers, weight loss, stunting of growth, or delayed puberty. The location and type of intestinal inflammation helps us distinguish Crohn's disease from ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's disease, inflammation can occur anywhere throughout the GI tract, from the mouth to the anus, with the terminal ileum being one of the most commonly affected sites. Inflammation classically occurs in a patchy pattern with areas of diseased intestine separated by healthy intestinal tissue. A subset of patients with Crohn's disease have a tendency to form strictures and or fistula. A stricture is a narrowing of the intestine. Fistula are abnormal connections between the intestine and other parts of the body, commonly the skin. Perianal fistula are the most common type of fistula seen in Crohn's disease and often present with perianal abscess. In ulcerative colitis, intestinal inflammation is limited to the colon. It extends in a continuous fashion rather than in a patchy distribution. It can affect the entire colon, termed pancolitis, or part of it, but it is typically most severe in the rectum. Patients with IBD can also experience manifestations of their disease beyond the intestine, with skin, joints, liver, bones, and eyes being among the organ systems sometimes affected. Examples of skin manifestations include pyoderma gangrenosum and erythema nodosum. Joint manifestations include arthralgias and arthritis. Liver manifestations can include primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is inflammation of the bile ducts. Eye manifestations can include episcleritis and uveitis. Diagnosis involves a comprehensive evaluation, including blood and stool tests, upper endoscopy and colonoscopy with biopsies, and small bowel imaging. Blood tests. Complete blood counts, inflammatory markers, and albumin are the most important blood tests in IBD evaluation. Complete blood count may demonstrate anemia, or low red blood cell counts, elevated white blood cell counts, and elevated platelet counts. Systemic inflammatory markers, known as ESR and CRP, may also be elevated. Albumin, which is a protein found in the blood, serves as a marker of nutritional status and may be low in patients with IBD. It is important to note that normal blood work does not exclude the diagnosis of IBD, especially in mild cases. Stool tests. It is important to perform stool cultures and C. difficile testing to evaluate for infections that can cause intestinal inflammation and diarrhea and mimic IBD. Stool is also typically tested for blood and calprotectin, which is a marker of intestinal inflammation. Upper endoscopy, EGD, and colonoscopy with biopsies. This is the gold standard testing for IBD diagnosis. EGD allows for evaluation of the esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Ileocolonoscopy allows for evaluation of the colon and the terminal ileum.
the endoscopist will look for inflammatory changes that are suggestive of IBD, which can include erythema or redness, friability or tendency to bleed, ulcerations, exudate or pus, and loss of typical blood vessel pattern. They will also take small pinches of tissue called biopsies, which a pathologist will look at under a microscope. Ultimately, this allows for characterization of the location and severity of intestinal inflammation, which helps with treatment selection. Small bowel imaging. The small intestine between the duodenum and the terminal ileum is not accessible by standard EGD and colonoscopy. Therefore, small bowel imaging, such as MR enterography or CT enterography, is often recommended for assessment of small bowel inflammation. Treatment. The goal of treatment is clinical and endoscopic remission, that is, for the patient to be symptom-free with restoration of healthy intestinal tissue. We also strive for patients to feel well and participate fully in school, work, and other activities without restriction. In the long term, control of intestinal inflammation is also important in prevention of complications of disease. Complications of chronically uncontrolled intestinal inflammation can include strictures, fistula, and colon cancer, but these risks may be reduced with disease treatment. Treatment. Treatment options include medications as well as nutritional and surgical interventions. Selection depends on the type of IBD, its location, severity, presence of fistula, and patient's preference. Some options are used to induce remission, that is, to get disease under control quickly. Others are slower in onset of action and can work well to maintain the disease in remission. Major categories of IBD therapeutics include 5-aminosalicylates, immune modulators, biologics, small molecule inhibitors, and bridging therapies. Tables summarizing these medications are listed for your general reference, but detailed discussion is beyond the scope of this review. Most medications are approved only for adult IBD and are sometimes used off-label in pediatric patients. There is a lot of interest in the role of dietary therapy in IBD, including anti-inflammatory diets, such as exclusive ventral nutrition, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, and the specific carbohydrate diet, as well as supplements such as curcumin. For the vast majority of patients, these serve as adjuncts and do not replace medical therapy. Surgical options. Surgery for ulcerative colitis can be curative and typically involves removing all of the colon. Surgery for Crohn's disease is instead used to address specific complications of Crohn's that are unresponsive to medical therapy. Major categories of surgery include drainage of abscesses, resection of areas that are medically refractory, such as strictures, fistulas, or perforated segments. A diverting ostomy, which diverts the fecal stream away from the inflamed colon, is another surgical strategy used to treat severe Crohn's disease. Conclusion. Thank you for watching this video on pediatric onset IBD. We hope you are equipped with an improved understanding of what is IBD, IBD phenotypes, diagnostic workup, goals of treatment, available treatment options. IBD comprises ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis involves continuous inflammation in the colon. Crohn's disease can affect any part of the GI tract, commonly the terminal ileum. Evaluation includes blood work, stool tests, endoscopy, and imaging. Treatment aims for clinical and endoscopic remission. This work was developed with the support of the Helmsley Charitable Trust.